Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Arkansas Representative Deborah Ferguson, as you know, NCOL president, and I'll be chairing this meeting today. Uh, as you know, this meeting is typically chaired by the vice president, but as I stated earlier, Tom Oliverson's in session and he couldn't be with us, so I'll be chairing it today. Uh, could I have a motion to waive the quorum? So moved. Second. Okay. All right. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes. Uh, could I have a motion to approve the November 18th committee meeting minutes? Travis. Second. Uh, Travis. Oh, Travis. Oh, okay. Uh, all in favor say aye. All opposed? Okay, the motion passes. Uh, before we get started, uh, I just want to note how great it is to again see such a large number of commissioners <laughs> uh, attending our conference. We're now reaching the point where this type of large group of commissioners in attendance is becoming the norm, and I think that's great for each of our respective organizations. Um, the high turnout of commissioners recently is an observable manifestation of our improved relationship throughout the years. We may not always agree on every issue, but we do need to disagree agreeably. Um, can you all please, all the commissioners, would you all please introduce yourselves and then we'll get started with the agenda. Clara, you want to start? <laughs> sure, I will. Uh, good afternoon and thank you on behalf of the commissioners for inviting us to participate. My name is Clorinan Lee Myers. I am the director of the Department of Commerce and Insurance in Missouri. I am also the 2023 NEIC president. Good afternoon. I'm Lori Winghire, and I'm the director in Alaska. Hello, I'm uh, Director Dean Cameron from Idaho and NEIC immediate past president. Hello, thanks for hosting this. I'm Troy Downing. I am the Montana State Auditor and the Commissioner of Securities and Insurance. Glenn Mulready, Oklahoma Insurance Commissioner. Alan McLean, Arkansas Insurance Commissioner. John Pike, Utah Insurance Commissioner. Good afternoon. My name is Vicki Schmidt. I'm the Insurance Commissioner in Kansas and actually served in the State Senate for 14 years there. And it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Any other commissioners in the audience? Okay, great. Thank you all for being here. Uh, the first item we want to discuss is the return of system systemically important financial institution designation. Uh, CIFIs, and Tom told me if I called it sci-fi, I couldn't be president anymore. <laughs> <laughs> As, as part of the overall effort to avoid a repeat of the 2008 financial crisis, the Dodd-Frank Act created the Financial Stability Oversight Council and gave it the ability to designate certain financial institutions, including insurers, as systemically important. From the beginning, serious concerns were raised surrounding the CIFI designation process as it relates to insurers. Since the designation subjected certain insurers to capital and regulatory requirements that were bank-centric and not rooted in an understanding of how the U.S. state-based system of insurance regulation functions pursuant to the McCarran-Ferguson Act. Additionally, the designation process was flawed because neither state insurance regulators or legislators had voting authority. After the financial crisis, AIG, MetLife, and Prudential were the designated insurance company entities, but they have all since been de-designated. Recently, there has been some um, FSOC meetings, some held behind closed doors, during which a topic of conversation was whether or not to bring back the CIFI designation. Does the NAIC know whether or not this revival will move forward and what is the N NAIC's position? All right, I will, I will take that uh, question. And at this point, the NAIC does not know if that will move forward, uh, but we recognize uh, uh, as FSOC members, our participation over the years through our representative who is currently Superintendent Beth Dwyer, uh, of the Rhode Island uh, Department of Business Regulation has enabled us to further 
cultivate relationships with our federal counterparts regarding financial regulatory community. And, it's, and when we're looking at that and looking at the issues that are there, the NEIC continues to believe that traditional insurance activities does not, I repeat, does not pose a systemic threat to the financial system. We consistently underscore the efficacy of the state insurance regulation and its strong record of protecting generations of policyholders. Us and our individual states working with our legislative colleagues is paramount to making sure that we are prudentially, um, we are holding prudential financial issues and regulations at the core of our individual state um, regulation in hand, that we don't need uh, any assistance from the federal government. We continue to always work with uh, uh, our banking and financial counterparts, you know, going forward. So it's, it, it's important that you understand that the movement to go away from CIFIs as far as the designation in December of 2022, the Financial Stability Board, or FSB, announced the dis discontinuation of annual identification of globally systemic important insurers, or GCIs, uh, recognizing that the activities uh, based in each individual state uh, is at the approach of the IAIS Holistic Framework uh, Committee, and it provides more than effective basis for addressing any systemic risk so we are, we are, will continue to advocate in Congress for federal regulations to provide the state insurance regu regulatory uh, representative with a vote on FSOC. Presently, we don't. As I had mentioned earlier, um, Beth Dwyer at, of Rhode Island is a non-voting member. And the primary uh, regulators of insurance sector ha uh, has the nest, we have the necessary expertise that is needed, and so we, we, uh, we've we informed FSOC of that and that we're monitoring the work. So we don't believe that uh, this is something that should come back, but we will, at, through the NEIC and our individual states, will continue to actively engage uh, with FSOC on this issue as well as broader issues uh, from a regulatory perspective and make sure that they understand that we have this matter well in hand. Thank you. Anyone have additional comments from the? I'm, I might just underline something that Cora said, and if, or Madam President said, if, if, and you could bypass it and not necessarily pay attention to it. We are the state's seat on FSOC, the insurance commissioners, but we are a non-voting member. We've asked Congress multiple times to be a voting member, that the states should have a voting seat on FSOC. We would certainly invite and COIL to endorse that idea or support that idea because I think it benefits both you as legislators in your states as well as us in the regulatory community. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next issue is an update on the enhanced cash surrender value developments. Uh, we've been discussing this issue for over a year now and it culminated with NCOIL adopting a resolution last summer identifying certain enhanced cash surrender value products as violating the standard non-forfeiture law. That resolution is uh, on the website and it's also in your legislative binders on page 87 if you wanted to refer to that. Since that time, the sponsor of that resolution, Indiana Senator Travis Holman, uh, in call immediate past president, introduced a bill in Indiana essentially codifying in statute what, we, what he was calling for in his resolution. That bill serves as the basis for the NCOIL life insurance, uh, that, that bill serves as the basis for the NCOIL life insurance is a Promise for Life Model Act, also sponsored by Senator Holman, which will be discussed later today during the Life Insurance and Financial Planning Committee. The model can be viewed in your binder on page 138. <clears throat> we, uh, we're aware that NAIC's A committee has been dealing with this issue and a survey has been sent to state insurance departments for reply with information on each respective department's interaction with certain enhanced cash surrender value products. Can you share with us the results of the survey? 
and what plans, if any, the NAIC has going forward with this issue. Thank you, Madam President. Glenn Mulready down this end, who will, will take that one. Um, and, and you guys have heard from me previously uh, on this issue, but uh, we took the NCOIL resolution and, uh, and with my urging there too with uh, Judy French, who's the um, chair of the A committee, uh, uh, put this survey out there. Uh, the base, there were some basic questions. Uh, you know, have you had applications received in your office uh, for that form? If so, who are the companies? If so, who were those offerings to? And sort of if so, how many offers were accepted or received there? So we, we don't have that report completed yet. Uh, it's being put into a more um, user-friendly, readable version uh, as we speak. But we do, um, uh, that was put out in October. We are in the midst of... Uh, of uh, uh, doing that. There's been some action taken. Part of the problem is that no state has specific action on that issue uh, as it stands today. Uh, Illinois did come out with a bulletin uh, basically stating that they, their position was it did not violate uh, the uh, smoothness factor for uh, universal life. Uh, we took action, we the state of Oklahoma, I took action where we um, basically notified the industry we would not be approving any going forward. Uh, and then asked those four companies who did have filings in our state to stand down and not make any additional offerings. Uh, they were very, very um, well received. I mean, I heard from a number of them and they totally understood and so they are doing exactly that, standing down. I know Louisiana uh, has, uh, has some action taken as well and um, Commissioner Donlin can talk to that in just, just a minute, but Indiana as well uh, uh, took some action. Those are the four indiv indiv individual states uh, that I'm aware of. I will tell you, in the big scope of all that we have going on, this is the results of that survey. It's a really, really small issue. Uh, I think at most, in, from what I have seen, and we've received um, responses, uh, survey response, about 35 folks that have responded to that. There have been maybe 20 offerings accepted nationwide amongst all the states where those have been offered. And, uh, and there's been offerings of, uh, you know, I don't know, 600 from one company and four or five or six maybe were accepted in that. But, and, and, only, and as far as I know, only in two states have um, offers been accepted at this point. Um, let's see what else I want to say. Yeah, ours went out in, uh, in October. Uh, I've talked about the smoothness. Yeah, in Illinois' bulletin there basically just said that the smoothness factor did not impact flexible premium universal life. Part of the problem, I think, is that some of these standards that were put out by the NEIC and the actuarial task force back when was, we're talking about 1980, <laughs> 1982, and UL was really just coming into play. And so I'm not sure how much of that was, was contemplated. But uh, I'll, I may flip it over to um, Commissioner Donlin to tell about what Louisiana has done. Thank you, Commissioner, and uh, Madam Chairman and, and members, Senator Mills, good to see you again. I was in Shreveport Monday morning, uh, and enjoyed my visit. Uh, but as, Senator, as Commissioner Mulready, uh, just to explain, we have taken action on the enhanced cash, cash value uh, by rescinding four uh, companies' approval, uh, farm approvals uh, for, that, uh, for that activity, uh, three of which you, uh, voluntarily said they would uh, discontinue marketing those, uh, those products and using those policy forms that had been approved back in 2019. A fourth, Lincoln National, has filed an appeal to our Division of Administrative Law, and that is uh, ongoing in appeal as we speak. Spoke to my Deputy Commissioner, Frank Opelka, this morning about the recently raised issue of retroactivity, uh, which, frankly, we had not considered. Uh, we rescind policy forms not all the time, but not um, unusual to uh, find that one of our policy form people, they're not lawyers, uh, uh, they're not experts, uh, made a mistake and approved a policy form 10 years ago or five years ago that, that's out there and being utilized. Um, I don't think this was a mistake as such, but it certainly was or is a difference of opinion uh, by me as a regulator versus the, the uh, whoever the commissioner was back when those forms were approved. I did, I very much agree that this is a discriminatory, prohibited discriminatory practice uh, and, and based on that as well as some activity uh, in the, uh, at the NAIC level uh, looking into the issues surrounding this uh, withdrew my approval and as I said the three companies that agreed have stood down in that activity. 
but it's not, in my judgment, an issue of looking back. We, we did tell the companies we have no, uh, no intention of taking action to, to penalize them for having done this in the past, and certainly the consumers who accessed it are happy. They have their check and are at home. Uh, so with that said, from my perspective, it's a go-forward uh, uh, issue only. Um, and uh, that said, um, it's good to see you again, Mr. Considine, and um, to be amongst uh, former colleagues. Some, I don't know if there's anybody around the table that was here or back home in the legislature when I was chairing the House Insurance Committee uh, back in those days, but, uh, but it is good to be back with NCOIL and uh, participating in this dialogue, which I've done many times over the years. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions. I might just add, um, Madam President, if I can, um, for those new to the issue, we've got a number of new members here, I know, so uh, quick summary. Basically, life insurance companies making offers for a substantially increased cash surrender uh, value could be 400% of what the actual cash surrender value is uh, at that time. And uh, the folks that have really pushed back against it is the life settlement folks, because basically they're, what they're stating is they're doing life settlement, just calling it something different. And in the life settlement world, there are consumer protections in place. Uh, you've got a, it's got to be a physician involved. You've got a right of rescission, that sort of thing, and that isn't happening in this place. So those consumer consumer protections are missing, which is what we in the regular world are most concerned about. So, uh, and I might add through that survey too, in, in the cross nationally, we have received no complaints about any of these that have been uh, accepted uh, or offered. Thank you. Can I can I say something? Thank you. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I totally agree with what you're doing. Everything's fine. But one thing to remember, and a thing I'm surprised you're not dealing with it, and Judy and I are really close, as you know, is uh, universal life. And the product's only universal life. You know, I'm a CLU. I have, when I owned that company, I had all these policies that are going to blow up in like 10 to 15 years. And because of the TEFRA guidelines and the IRS guidelines, they can't just drop the policy in half and double the premium. I mean, I mean, I can show you case after case where all they can do maybe is drop at 10 or 15%, and that's not going to really change that much. I mean, uh, these companies that did that, there is an op. If you're 10, 15 years ago where it's blowing up, and some of these people, even if they wanted to pay more, they've gone over the, the, the guidelines of, of what they could pay in the policy. So... I mean, could they literally say, hey, it's probably better for the consumer to cash the policy in now if we incentivize them to do it than to wait when the policy blows up? See, I didn't realize it's only on, this is only on universal life. We have major, major problems based on that law. And I agreed with the law. It wasn't 80. It was in the late 80s. We used to sell universal life. I had a case where we sold 100,000. I sold 150. They put 100,000 in it. The death benefit was only 150000 We gave the individual his money back in two years, and there was enough cash in the policy. He ended up paying a little more later to run the policy without paying anything. And the IRS said, that's not a, you know, they came back and said, that's not a life insurance product. It's a tax deferred product. I agree. You know, they changed the law, and I agreed with that. But now we've got a lot of middle-class people that want to have one policy in place. They're between 75 and 85 years old, and their universal life is blowing up, and they can't re – and I agree you shouldn't reduce it below the minimum issue of the policy, but they can't reduce it to, like, say, 50 percent or 60 percent of the value because it's TEFRA or IRS guidelines of what they're allowed to put in that policy. So, so I mean, I don't disagree with what you're doing, but maybe they're trying to protect the consumer to catch that policy in – before it blows up in 10 years. I mean, I, I would love to see a reaction to what I just said to, to anybody over there to see that because, I mean, it isn't two or three. I've probably got 50 policies of a group that I took over, and they were replacement artists. I agree. They're, they replaced all this whole life on the concept, we can double your insurance, same out-of-pocket. That's all they did. And, what, of course, it was based on 9 and 10% interest rates. I was in the business at Peru at that time, and I made them sign, the client sign a form that it, if it averaged under 6%, it would blow up. It wouldn't make it, even though we were paying 10 and 11%.
So I just want to see the reaction to, to you guys on what about all these policies that are, that are blowing up and the people, and people aren't real happy to lose their life insurance. Tell me, tell me what the reaction, you know, what your reaction is to that. Th thank you for that feedback. I just think it's really good feedback and something else for us to consider uh, similarly related to this. And, and I don't have a great response for you except that thank you for bringing that to the forefront. Uh, and, and I was with John Hancock at that same time, licensed in 1983, so we're both showing our age. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that feedback. It's good feedback. Mm -hmm. I do. Um, my only comment would be I've been dealing with that issue for 10, 15 years. Uh, some more aggressive investors, as you described, uh, felt the pain, the impossible uh, situation they found themselves in a decade ago. Has anyone done anything that's been effective to address or to solve the problem? I don't think regulation can fix it. I really don't. The Fed, we need the feds to fix it. You know, we, we can't fix it. The feds have to fix it. All they have to do is say, you can drop the policy by 50. They've got to change those guidelines in case based on the people's age and whatever and, and the shape of the policy. But they don't want to come in. They want to set one set of rules for everybody. And I understand why they did what they did. They were not life insurance policies. But you know, if you've been in the business, you know how many of those we have on the books. And they're going to keep blowing up over the next 10, 15 years. Well, I was not in the business, but, but you're right. And I've seen it happening already, but it is only going to get worse. Uh, should, you, should we and you as legislators advocate for a, a resolution from us, from y'all, to Congress asking them to fix the problem? Uh, maybe. Thank you. Uh, on our interim Zoom call, I don't know, we've done this NAIC dialogue for a long time, and one of them pointed out a dialogue is between two people, not just one. We've always just asked the commissioners questions, and they said we might want to ask y'all questions. So do any of you have a question for our call on this issue? No? You're good? Okay. Uh, uh, Senator Holman, did you want to comment on your uh, bill? Sure, I'd be glad to, and uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for uh, raising the issue, uh, which is a good one and one that I plan on addressing during the Life Insurance Committee's meeting later today. Uh, I think there's a misunderstanding by some who view the model as asking for the commissioners uh, to rescind existing agreements that have been entered into between the consumer and the insurer. That's not the case, and frankly, couldn't be the case, as we couldn't be uh, pushing ourselves uh, in between the company the insurance company and the client uh, for fear of a contractual interference. Uh, the model is only asking for the commissioner to rescind the regulatory approval of the farms on a go forward basis so that doesn't impact any existing contracts. If the language needs to be tweaked in the model to make that more clear, I'm happy to work on that. And thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for the opportunity. I would say that uh, when I filed the legislation in Indiana, <clears throat> I quickly got a response from one of the companies uh, that was in the practice of, of doing the enhanced surrender value uh, offer, uh, soliciting the offer to their uh, policyholders. And uh, we came to an agreement that I would not advance the bill uh, as long as we continue our discussion. And so uh, hopefully the NAIC and we as a uh, organization ourselves can come forward with a recommendation and some resolution to the problem. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we'll move on to the next topic, which is issues relating to tribal insurers. The NAIC American Indian and Alaska Native Liaison Committee has been doing a lot of interesting work regarding insurance issues specific to tribal nations. We're also aware of a survey that was conducted by that committee relating to the growing insurance markets and business models of certain tribal insurers. Can you share with us the results of the survey and what plans, if any, the NAIC has going forward with regard to these issues? Uh, Madam President, uh, I'll, I'll take that one, and thank you. So uh, first, a little bit of uh, background about uh, AIAN, the uh, American Indian Alaska Native Liaison Committee. Um, you know, 
fundamentally that's there for consumer protection and access to markets and that's why that uh, uh, committee exists and I think we did a lot of good work on that last year you know some stuff I'm personally very proud of that the committee achieved in creating documents on cultural awareness on communicating between you know non-tribal and tribal members we did uh, a document on access to Affordable Care Act plans. We did another one on lessons learned during the pandemic. So we, we, we produced some, some interesting information back then. Um, and one of the things that came up while I was uh, chairing that committee is um, we received a, uh, uh, a complaint actually that was uh, in Maine about um, this uh, sovereign nation's uh, insurance. And uh, so when we first heard about that, you know, I'd reached out to sovereign nations to see if they were um, willing to present to the committee, which they did, and we were happy to see that happen. And so uh, just a little bit of um, background for people to understand what sovereign nations insurance is, is it's a consortium of, of three tribes um, in Utah, and uh, they've created an insurance company that right now is doing health insurance, but they've made it clear that they plan on looking at other lines as well. And uh, so they've also created a, I'll say a regulatory body that's the uh, Sovereign Nations Health Consortium. And then finally, they have a nonprofit association called the Native American Restoration um, Association. And the premise of what they're doing is they are, they made it very clear that they plan on selling policies um, on reservation, off reservation, to enrollee, enrolled members of tribes and to non-enrolled members. Um, you know, uh, we had uh, Mark Echohawk as their general counsel who came and, and presented to us, and he made it very clear that they consider uh, non-tribal members as part of their community and, and intended to sell them um, policies as well. And, you know, one of the kind of interesting things about the way they're doing this is uh, they have this, uh, I'd mentioned the Native American Restoration Association, which um, is a nonprofit that, uh, you know, that they say does a lot of work in supporting, uh, you know, Native American and indigenous population issues. Um, but you need to join that association and thereby agree to be bound by the tribal law rather than the state law. And, you know, the obvious concerns, you know, this, you know, on its surface seems to, you know, fly in the face of McCarran-Ferguson, and so we've got a lot of issues on, on how to deal with that, um, and uh, I think that's going to be, you know, something, something bigger than the individual states, because I think that's, that, that's going to be much larger. So we did do a survey, as you, as you asked, uh, Madam President, on, on getting responses from states, and we're still getting information about that and trying to put that together. Uh, some of the interesting ones is uh, the state of Washington has put a cease and desist in, in place to stop them from um, uh, selling these, these products in, in Washington. I, I know there's some other states that are looking closely at that to try to figure out what it is. But I'm going to go back to my main theme that I started with is, you know, there, there's, a, there's a consumer protection issue. You know, these, uh, these plans are being marketed as, as um, you know, marketplace plans, as ACA plans, and, and they're not. Uh, they don't have the same protections. They don't have the same coverages. And so we're, we're particularly concerned about the consumer protection issue there. Um, and uh, so I'm going to um, hand this off to uh, Commissioner Mulready because I understand he just had a recent meeting with uh, Sovereign Nations. So, uh, Commissioner Mulready. Thank you. Yes, I, I um, had dug into this issue as well when that came about. Oklahoma has a lot of tribal um, nations within our borders, 39 federally recognized tribes. And um, I met oh, Tuesday, Wednesday of this week with their executive team. They flew out to Oklahoma and, uh, and we sat down. And uh, <clears throat> um, Commissioner Downing has covered uh, most of it, you know, the thing that I think wasn't stated that needs to be clearly stated is they believe they operate fully outside of state, the re state regulatory environment, that as a sovereign nation, they do not have to abide by state law or our state uh, insurance departments. Um, and so that, that's, uh, that, that's concerning. Uh, they did mention to me specifically that when I asked about other insurance coverage, uh, that they were very much moving next into burial insurance, some life insurance, small life insurance policies to cover uh, burial, um, burial items. 
when, when asked about the McCarran-Ferguson Act, um, or let me back up, I guess the, uh, right away as they described how they were structured, which I already knew because I was in that meeting in Portland, uh, I knew how they were structured. They had this SNHC and then they had a, which is their regulator, and then they had a wholly owned subsidiary that was an insurance company. And I asked them if they thought that was odd <laughs> that the regulator would own an insurance company and um, they, they really did not, that didn't strike them as odd as it did me. <laughs> but at any rate, um, I, we, we did uh, ask them about that and um, they, they are, they're moving forward. Uh, they were um, very, uh, uh, very pleasant and uh, were trying to figure out a way that they could work with us. We didn't really have a lot of um, common ground to offer them. We said, you know, if you want to do business in Oklahoma, this is the path. And uh, so I think they, they were being educated a bit on the path working within the, uh, within the NEIC. But we did finally uh, talk about McCarran-Ferguson as well, which is pretty direct that it's left to the states when it comes to insurance. It was interesting, their response to that was that uh, since McCarran-Ferguson was silent on tribes, uh, they felt like federal Native American law sort of overruled that or superseded that at that point. So it was an interesting take on that, but that was literally just days ago, my conversation with them. Yeah, one of the things that they've been doing is I know they've been reaching out to certain states trying to work on memos of understanding to operate in those. And I think Utah was one of those. I don't know, Commissioner Pike, if you have anything to say on that. Yes, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner. Um, that's what they've been touting. They're, they're basically saying that they would consider doing a, an agreement or a compact, whatever you'd like to say, with any state uh, that would like to do that. On the other hand, uh, it doesn't mean that they would be subject to state law, is what they're saying. And in the, in the absence of that kind of an agreement, they're basically saying, but we're prepared to go it alone. And, and they acknowledge, and my colleagues all remember them saying this, that uh, this may well end up at the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, or in Congress because of, as Commissioner Moe already said, you know, just the absence maybe of specifics in McCarran-Ferguson or, or, or other federal law. So it's going to be interesting. Uh, I don't know how many of you have watched the Netflix series Stranger Things um, or your grandkids or your kids, but it's kind of like the upside down. You don't know what I'm talking about unless you've watched it, but kind of a parallel universe of insurance that could that's started, and albeit small, about 9,000 members, Glenn, is that what yep. they told you the other day? And uh, because these folks are literally my neighbors, quite literally, uh, their council lives uh, about 10 miles from my house. Uh, their chief legal counsel. Good people, I think good intentions, but it's, um, uh, to be technical, it's a little spooky. Uh, yeah, I, might, I might add, too, if I can, just we've focused on this one group here, a lot of our conversation, but I think this issue as a whole, the sovereign nations, small s, if you will, um, is, is a big issue for us. I just became aware this week there was an op-ed in our newspaper, the Oklahoma, the Oklahoma City newspaper, by uh, someone who, who's the head of a tribe in Oklahoma who has been licensing captives. And he wrote an op-ed about it. So that's how we became aware of it. So we will be investigating that. But I just think this is a, a growing issue across the board. Right, and just to kind of put a, a bow on that, I mean, our, we, obviously we have a number of concerns, but probably the, the first one is just the consumer protection issue as we have folks selling unlicensed product in our states with uh, that the we, uh, what, what we've seen has been somewhat misleading and just making sure that we uh, uh, deal with that appropriately because, you know, consumer protection is obviously very high on our, on our concerns. So on that. Do you have any examples of maybe where it was inappropriate insurance like lifetime limits or monthly limits where well, people thought they had coverage and they didn't. I, I had that question and then my second the, question, are they in any way tied into the Indian Health Service services? Well, that, that one's easy. They're not, they're not tied into a IHS, but in terms of, you know, we, we actually, uh, we had a commissioner's meeting not too long ago where we just um, looked at some of their marketing videos and uh, the one that stood out to me was they had a program for mental health where you went onto a waiting list until you got a meeting with a chatbot. 
So, you know, that's, that's some of the stuff that's in there. There was uh, also, and I don't remember the exact details, but there were some, um, uh, some mentioning of pre-existing conditions only be, being covered a certain percentage the first year, a higher percentage the third year, a higher percentage the fourth year. So it was like, you know, uh, phasing in coverage of pre-existing conditions. So there, were, there, were, there were a lot of deficits like that. And I, th I think I heard you say they are not just covering Native Americans, but other individuals as well, just sort of unregulated insurance. That's correct. Yeah, yes. correct. But any but legislators have questions? I'm sorry. I, if I, if okay. while you're finding no, questions, ahead. I just, yeah. um, when we were at this same meeting, our counterpart in Colorado has a claim that he's working on a consumer complaint. And an individual with one of these plans went into the emergency room. Oh, and was told this was an ACA compliant plan only to be not admitted at when he went in the emergency room and because this person was not admitted they denied the whole claim and he now has a bill for several thousand dollars it's that type of thing that we're trying to protect consumers it's a fine line um, of what we're trying to do work with consumers in our states on these plans that we don't have authority and madam chair I do know too in the state of Massachusetts my old home state uh, they've had a number of complaints uh, on, on this group and there's one in particular there's an article in the Boston Globe about a similar incident that you just heard about here where a woman presented the ER I, I want to say it was a 20,000 something dollar claim and had no coverage for that too so that there's a Boston Globe article on that piece there as well okay thank you um, next we're going to discuss the development of the NAIC data privacy model law the NAIC is working to amend its Insurance Information and Privacy Protection Model Act and its Privacy of Consumer Financial and Health Information Regulation, with the end result being a new NAIC Consumer Privacy Protection Model Law. The proposed uh, amendments you can find on page 90 of your, um, of your manuals. Uh, we understand that the NAIC Privacy Protection Working Group recently exposed for comment the first draft of the model law. Can you provide us with an update as to what led to the NAIC opening up these models as well as a summary of the proposed amendments and what is the timeline for possible adoption by NAIC? So I will take that, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, after extensive work on uh, the models, and what led to it is the fact that the models hadn't been updated since the late 80s, early 90s, and everything has changed since then, frankly. And so, uh, so that's why we were trying to sort of tidy up uh, not only uh, model number 690, uh, 672, I'm sorry, but 670 as well, and, and perhaps combine the two. Uh, so that you, you know, because there were, or there were things that was in the model that was basically outdated that you'd have to put things in newspapers or whatever, not taking into account that there, uh, that you can send it, you know, electronically and how you can do it and, and that sort of thing. So uh, the intent, of course, of the draft model is to promote uniformity amongst all the states uh, that we can, if we can get the state consumer data uh, protection laws sort of united. So on a state-by-state -state basis, it makes it easier for the uh, insurers and the industry to, to operate a, a, across state lines if our legislators would put that into action. With our draft, we've attempted to modernize and streamline consumer uh, data privacy notifications and disclosures with respect to the insurance uh, processes of third-party service providers. That was not a big deal back necessarily back in the 80s and early 90s. So we're trying to make sure that that is out there. It also includes providing consumers with clear information about their rights regarding con cons consent to use their data, the sale of their personal uh, information, transparency, and the details of adverse uh, underwriting decisions. We wanted to make sure that uh, most of the language in this new model was drawn from the NEIC's existing privacy models through new concepts which were incorporated in legislation that had been passed recently in all of the various states. The deadline for this exposed draft model is coming up for April 3rd. Uh, we're hoping to have all of that information into us by that timeline. 
the working group is working uh, diligently and looking forward to hearing from stakeholders and others who are engaged in, in, in further discussions on how we can develop it, how it will be uh, something that could be utilized not only by uh, regulators but also by the industry and consumers. So that is, uh, we want to make sure that, uh, that you know, everyone's voice is heard and that people understand, you know, basically what, what's going on, especially in light of the fact that uh, there have been data breaches and people's information has been exposed. Do you all have any questions for NCOIL on the... Uh, Senator Utke, do you want to maybe inform them a little bit about the Model Act? Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for that question. Uh, yes, tomorrow our multi-alliance committee will be discussing the Virginia law in contemplation of using this as a starting point for the development of an NCOIL model act. We're still in the early stages of that process as a decision hasn't been made yet as to whether to proceed or not. But either way, the overall topic of that data privacy and in the insurance context what insurers can and cannot do with consumers' data is so important that we at NCOIL feel we need to be discussing it in some manner. After the discussion tomorrow, we will evaluate whether to move forward or not with a model act on that issue. I do have a question for the commissioners, if I may. Since we'll be discussing Virginia's law tomorrow, do the NIH do the NAIC's proposed amendments to its models have any similarity with Virginia's law, or do they conflict in any way with Virginia's law? Uh, they, since the coach, since the chair of the Privacy Act is from Virginia, it's in line with the Virginia law. Uh, it, uh, the uh, Katie is uh, is one of the the um, co-chairs of that committee and she is from Virginia. So Virginia and Missouri is working on it. Uh, and it has some of the things that are in there, but there are some conflicts in particular that is in the Virginia law that is in conflict with Missouri law. So I don't, and I don't know what other states it might be in conflict with. That's why we want to sort of flesh this out and make sure that, uh, that everybody, you know, has a stake in it. Well, maybe we need to soften this or build this up. So that's the purpose of having, the, you know, the com this ongoing conversation. Representative Lyman, you have a question. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, yeah, so uh, Indiana, we just passed the Virginia model out of the Senate. I should say they just passed out of the Senate. Uh, I am the House sponsor of uh, Senate Bill 5. Um, so in going through that, what was interesting to me is seeing the pieces of that puzzle that allow someone to say, you know, they, they can ask, are you using my data? Two is, um, I need to be able to correct adverse data. But one of is, I, I can ask to be exempt. So if, if I, are, are, we, are we heading towards, and I know we have later in your conversation here about artificial intelligence, and that's the area I have with, with my model. Are, are we on some form of a collision course here? If I want my data not to be used by an insurance carrier, how does that play now into their models of underwriting using much more artificial intelligence? And, and I think, so that's, that's the only thing as I see in that Virginia model is, there's a lot of protections for the consumer, which I fully support, but I think it might run counter to what the industry as a whole, and we'll ask the industry this question tomorrow, is do you, do you as the regulator see pieces within that Virginia model that would actually be in conflict now with what some carriers are doing? And, and I would have to answer yes, that I see that it would be in conflict. But the hope is, is that we could try to smooth it out, and, and I'm, I'm not sure how we can do that, such that it, it, it would allow people, because it's, the, it's my personal information, your personal information. If you choose to exclude it, then how is it, I, I don't know how the companies can utilize, especially if it's a whole bunch of us that's, you know, one side or the other. I don't know how they could actually utilize that data in order to create rates using AI. And so that is a, a bone of contention, if you would, uh, that, you know, we'd have to look at and try to exercise in or out how we were going to do that and how we were going to display that. So I do think that there are issues that are going to collide, and I think 
our jobs as regulators is try to figure out how to minimize that or eradicate it if we can. Representative Bennett, did you have a question? Oh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, <clears throat> yes, so I'm excited about this conversation that we're going to have tomorrow on this issue. Um, and in Oklahoma, where I uh, am from, we've had conversations the last couple of years uh, over data privacy. And sort of the overarching concern of the opponents of it at the state level is we understand that there is an issue. Um, ultimately, a patchwork of laws across the country is not the solution, and you all have spoken to that already. Um, the other alternative to adopting a model law across the country is federal uh, solution. And I know none of us are holding our breath for that, but I wonder if any of you have had conversations with anyone at the federal level about whether there is any inkling of an idea of doing that at the federal level. I would say the answer to that is yes. So that's why it's important for us to get together, legislators as well as you know, regulate, the regulators, the commissioners, superintendents, and directors to get together to come up with something because you know best what would be helpful for Oklahoma, people in Oklahoma. I may know best what you know is best for uh, Missouri, and then of course our, our legislators would know that. So we've got to come, in, in my mind, got to come to a point where we can kind of all get together on that to say, hey, we know what's going on there. You're sitting in D.C. You, you know, you don't know what's happening in our individual states. So let us come together and try to come up with something that will be uh, amenable to all of our constituents in all of our states so that you, they don't need to get involved. I, Representative, I think the answer is if we don't, and by we, this is if we don't, they will. Matt. Um, thank you. Um, one last kind of comment on this. I mean, when, you, when we as on this side of the table hear a lot about the things you're working on, are these models available for us to look at as well? I mean, is there in your, they're in your part of your work product, but if they're not actually the finished product, can we see where those are at compared to like what we're working on at our end? You can. It was exposed. It's, it's on our website, on the NAIC okay. website, and it was exposed as of February 1st. Now, it may have taken a day or two to get on there, but it is on there now. I mean, okay. it was when I looked at it probably on Wednesday. I haven't looked at it since. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Will just told me that the model's on our website as well, so we want to look at it. Thank you. If no one has any other comments on this. <laughs> uh, I didn't know that either. <laughs> 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 uh, Okay, I hate to even move to this. We are going to briefly discuss this because tomorrow we're going to have a really extensive general session on it. But uh, the preview of the ESG, or Environmental, Social, and Governance, um, as you likely know, NCOIL announced last month a special series of general sessions to be held throughout NCOIL's 2023 national meetings focusing on ESG. The series will be co-facilitated by NCOIL Treasurer, a new look assembly woman, Pamela Hunter, and NCOL Vice President uh, uh, Tom Oliverson. The goal of the series is strictly educational and will bring together a wide range of experts to address the challenges and opportunities presented by all different types of ESG public policy. The first session of the series will be held immediately following this dialogue and will serve as an introduction to ESG with a substantial focus on environmental policy this time. We plan to address environment, then social, then governance at three different sessions. We know that NAIC doesn't have a formal ESG position, and neither does NCOIL, but we are interested in hearing about the work of your Climate and Resiliency Task Force and the NIIC opt-in ensures climate risk disclosure reporting requirement. The Climate Risk Disclosure Reporting Survey, uh, you can find on page 93 if you have your manuals that we give out. Uh, can you share with us the plans for the task force for this year and beyond? Thank you, Madam President. If if I might first uh, just take a, a matter of personal privilege. Uh, first of all, thank you this morning for the recognition and um, uh, deeply heartfelt. Um, I have really enjoyed uh, and 
I'm not going anywhere, so I'm not, this isn't, this isn't me saying goodbye, but I've enjoyed being with this group of commissioners who have uh, seen how important it is to work with NCOIL and are, have been at a lot of meetings. I, I know we recognized Lori earlier for having so many consecutive meetings. She's, she's done great. But I also want to thank you for the relationship. Um, special thanks to Tom Considine and to you, Madam President, and to Matt Lehman, um, who have worked uh, really well with the NEIC over this last over this last year. And I, I can remember the first NQL meeting I attended as a state senator was in Boston. Um, and by the way, I found the program for that. I'll have to share it with you, Tom. Um, and the insurance commissioner. Um, sat at that table by herself uh, and it, it was not as an amicable meeting as this one is. Um, and so we've come a long ways and we recognize that we, we want to work with you. We, we need to work together. And as you said at the beginning, there are going to be times where from a legislative perspective, something that we're doing doesn't make sense and there are going to be times where it's the other way. but. Uh, the more we can communicate and talk about those issues and work through them, at least you know where we're coming from and you can make those decisions. Now, um, and, and we have to handle difficult decisions, such as the one that I'm going to talk about now. I missed the meeting, by the way, and was assigned to talk about ESG. Um, so uh, let me just say that um, climate, natural disasters, access to coverage, Resiliency it has been an NEIC priority and remains an NEIC priority under Director Linda Meyer's leadership. We are working uh, very diligently to work to close gaps in coverage. Uh, it is interesting to me as we work in the international market where we're seeing uh, lots of gaps of coverage um, and yet some of the regulatory decisions help create those gaps. Um, we continue to advocate for a long-term national flood insurance program uh, or uh, allowing us to have a more robust uh, private flood insurance program. Um, we stood up this last year the Catastrophic Modeling Center of Excellence, which allows the NAIC and our commissioners to gather uh, a lot of data and, and information that will help us um, make appropriate decisions. Um, we are doing much work through the NEIC Climate uh, and Resiliency EX Task Force. Um, and one of our leaders in that task force is uh, Director Lori Wing Heyer. So I'm going to turn some time to her uh, to address that. And after she's through, then we'll ask Alan to uh, rep uh, Director uh, McLean to talk about solvency work stream. Thanks, Dean. And as Dean said, I am co-chairing this year the Climate and Resiliency Task Force along with Ricardo Lero, the Commissioner in California. I'm also the NEIC representative for the S Sustainable Insurance Forum at the UN. There's many things we are working on and we're finding more and more that we're walking a fine line in dealing with some of these topics. Certainly, as you can see on our, our website that is now live with a, uh, a page dedicated to resources, we're looking at, at building codes and land use. We're working with consumers on mitigation efforts. We're also dealing with local, state, and federal regulators, legislators on consumer incentives, resiliency funding. And we continue to work with almost anybody that'll talk to us on looking at other solutions to deal with the catastrophic losses that have been felt, no doubt, if it's wildfire, if it's the storms in the south, the wildfires in the west, the droughts in California, uh, even my own state had a typhoon north of the Arctic Circle last year, so we all recognize the change to the climate and our need to help the insurers to stay solvent to help reduce these losses. It's the thing to do. But we also recognize when we talk about gaps in insurance, not only is it hard to find property coverage in many states right now, we are also finding it very hard for some of our contractors to find insurance. And why is this important? Well, it's important because the heat that comes to your home, be it gas or home heating fuel, the same companies that are also looking at risks, their own ESG programs are stepping away from insuring those entities. And it is creating a hardship for many contractors. Our 
our thought and our goals are to have a transition, to work on a transition that insurance will still be available so that we have fuel in our cars, that we have home heating fuel, that you're, when you turn on the, the on button on your oven, if you're natural gas, there will be something at the other end. As we go forward, we, we have found that we cannot shut it off all at once, so we're working very hard to work with reinsurers and insurers to, to admit that we have to have a transition off of carbon base. We don't want to leave the planet worse than we found it, so our emphasis is in recognizing these storms uh, that have happened, the, the wildfires, the devastation that they have caused, but also saying that we have to have a plan to walk away, and we're not there yet. And so the gap is, again, it's not just the property market, which several of my colleagues here can tell you what has happened in their home states, and many of you know, but also the products that we get from oil, gas, coal, and other natural resources that we still need until we have an alternative source. Anyone else? Any commissioners? Huh? Oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Alan. No, I was just going to move in. If nobody had any questions for, more, for Lori on that, I was just going to move into giving a brief report on the solvency work stream. And personal privilege, it's a great honor to have our uh, um, Representative Ferguson from Arkansas as president of NCOIL, so it's just so good to be here. And, it is a little strange being around the table with so many Arkansas legislators, but uh, uh, after just seeing you in the last few days in the Capitol, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's great to have so many of them here with us. But, um, <clears throat> and I also chair the Property and Casualty C Committee at NAIC, where some of the issues regarding access to different uh, lines of insurance come up, and, and some of these matters uh, will, will um, often be a topic at, 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 the, at the C Committee. But just with regard to the, the solvency work stream, I wanted to give a quick report. <clears throat> I apologize for my voice for how long it'll last. But our, our, work, our solvency work, work stream has been exploring and receiving stakeholder input on potential enhan enhancements to the existency regulatory solvency tools that we all use in our departments, uh, and, but, but th to the tools that address climate risk in particular. So la last year, the work stream recommended that modifications to the NAIC's financial analysis handbook, the financial condition uh, examiner's handbook, and the ORSA guidance manual to be considered by the appropriate NAIC groups. Uh, so specific to wildfires, the work stream recommended that a wildfire, wildfire peril be added to the risk-based capital framework for catastro uh, catastrophe risk exposures. Uh, that recommendation was adopted, and beginning this year, the Property Casualty Risk-Based Capital e-working group will require companies, for informational purposes only, to re annually report their modeled wild wildfire risk. So that will be good data to collect. This will help to ensure that companies are adequately reserving the capital necessary to maintain their, their financial condition when wildfires do occur. After collecting the data for a couple years and measuring against benchmarks, then the NAIC will consider an appropriate capital charge to be applied. So based on recommendation from the Solvency Work Stream, the risk-based capital e-working group is now looking into collecting modeled losses on severe convective storms, again, for informational purposes only. So since the summer national meeting, the Solvency Work Stream has hosted several panel discussions to understand the various approaches to, to scenario analysis, including panelists from several financial organizations as, as we look at, at different models. So that's really all I had to add on the solvency work stream. And, and Madam President, if we, if we might, I'd like to have our, our President take just a few minutes on recent insurance and then I'll take just a few closing comments, if you would. Thank, thank you. Um, I, I do want to uh, make sure that you understand that the NEIC EX uh, Committee on Race and Insurance is still working. Uh, the special committee and its work streams are focused on closing the protection gaps uh, for underrepresented and minority communities by addressing any barriers uh, to access and expanding any opportunities in the insurance sector. At the NEIC's fall meeting, uh, the special, which was in Tampa uh, in December, the uh, special committee unanimously adopted the recommendations that regulators, industry, and special uh, and, and um, uh, industry representatives can follow to improve upon their diversion 
uh, diversity and inclusion efforts. One of the issues is it's not a number counting. It's not, I had three yesterday, tomorrow I have four. It is more what are they doing on, on a systemic level of trying to increase diversity in their ranks, which is, you know, women, which is people of color, which is people with, you know, disabilities and the like. So it's not, when we're looking at on race and insurance, it's all underrepresented uh, areas that we're looking at. Uh, we've adopted various recommendations, which you can find on at the special committee website on the, NE, on the NEIC's page. This year, the life and property, as well as the uh, life and property and casualty, as well as the health work streams will renew their focus on looking at each individual area and what can be done uh, to enhance the process of trying to get more people uh, into the insurance industry, as well as, uh, you know, what, um, what barriers might exist that we might be able to look at and overcome. And Dean, did you want to talk about the uh, foundation? Yeah, I'll just take a minute. Uh, first, I want to recognize our president, Claire Lindley Myers, who was just recognized and uh, awarded uh, for her efforts on race and insurance. She's been a dynamic leader there and uh, for years and uh, was just recognized. Uh, one of the things that the NEIC did uh, at the start of last year is we uh, started to stand up the NEIC Foundation, which stands for New Avenues of, to Insurance Career Foundation. And its desire is to help people get into the insurance career model, not into the agent model, which I, I love agents, that's great, but it's into being actuaries and examiners and all of those highly technical uh, areas. W we have a shortage in the regulatory regime of those of those uh, people, of those individuals, those talents, and we know the industry has a shortage. We also know that there are lots of folks of different races, di different ethnicities, different genders who have not been able to access that pathway. And so our goal is is to do that. We the we have a board uh, that has been uh, set up and is established and has completed the bylaws. We've filed uh, to the IRS uh, for its approval. Uh, we will be putting forth um, uh, uh, our communications and we'll certainly keep uh, you informed on that. And we are also in the process of surveying the states to see how many would accept different internships because it's not only scholarships but internships, apprenticeships that we will push forward to get people into that, into that pathway. And then lastly, Madam President, I just want to thank NCOIL and your efforts in a thoughtful process. You always, um, as an organization, you put forth a thoughtful process, whether we're talking about private equity or in this case, at this meeting, ESG. Um, we recognize, and I know that you recognize, that we're in a hardening market. Uh, in the last two years, our market has become more and more difficult, and it's becoming more difficult, particularly in some rural states, but, but really everywhere. It's also becoming difficult, it's becoming difficult because of the items that Lori talked about, but also because of the reinsurance industry and some of the pressures that's on the reinsurance industry with regard to ESG. So the only thing that I would respectfully ask is that is, because we know almost every state is dealing with some ESG legislation. We'd love to know about it and we'd ask you to work with the insurance commissioners because that's the last thing we want to do although you will set the public policy, but the last thing we want to do is get down the stream and have less carriers offering coverages to our businesses and our families because of, uh, of some policy that was passed. So we, we stand ready to work with you and to make sure that that doesn't, that doesn't occur. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you all. I, I, we do have quite a few new legislators in the room, so, uh, I will buy you all a cup of coffee, whichever uh, commissioner can name all of your A, B, C, D, E, F, G committees. <laughs> y'all kept referencing A committee, B committee. Who, who can name them all? Gloria, your president. <laughs> a is for life. B is for health. C is property and casualty. D is market conditions or, you know, the market regulation. E is for financial. F is, uh, is for like our accreditation, G is for international, and H is our newly formed committee, which is for the uh, AI. 
I don't drink coffee, but... <laughs> I don't drink coffee, but if you could get a Coca-Cola for me <laughs> and, and Dean Cameron, you, you're on. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay, uh, we're the next discussion, uh, Assembly 100 is going to do a whole session on ESG, so I don't want to steal her thunder, but uh, this is obviously a very, you know, contentious topic, and it's very difficult among states, like many things, we realized at the last session to sort of reach a consensus on this issue. Um, I guess we're not, we are not going to have model legislation at NCOR. We just want to present an open discussion of ideas and make people aware of both sides of the issue. And then uh, there are already um, ESG legislation going on in uh, most states, I would say. I know Arkansas has already passed some ESG legislation around uh, investment banking. But, um, um, yeah, we, we, we want to have a polite discussion around it. Um, the next topic we were supposed to uh, discuss was the model bulletin on um, issues relating to artificial intelligence. But they tell me we've run out of time, so I think we'll hold that over till the summer meeting. And um, I guess in the meantime, if everybody could play around with ch chat GPT and <laughs> ask, it some ask it to answer your questions for the next meeting. Uh, um, if there's no other business, uh, we're adjourned. <laughs>